All right, fine. Yeah. Am I looking good? Do I look good? Yeah. Sure. Today I'm going to talk about Marshall McLuhan, the Zizek of the 60s. I think Marshall McLuhan is really comparable as an intellectual figure to Slavoj Zizek today. He's been called during the 1960s the high priest of pop cult and metaphysician of media. And similar to Zizek, he was combining philosophy and analysis of literature with pop culture and media analysis. He used a lot of humor, maybe not as much as Zizek, but still quite a bit, while at the same time being also very intellectual. Constant references to high culture, literature, philosophy, theology, and also science. Another parallel is his writing style. He called it himself mosaic. So it's an associative, short, often essayistic style, playing with aphorisms, witticisms, creating memes, and engaging in some sort of poetic variations of core ideas without actually even aiming at creating a coherent theoretical system. And he admits as much himself. I'm, I'm really exploring situations. I'm not trying to deliver some complete set of observations about anything. Another peril is that he's also been dismissed by, well, smug mainstream academics or figures of the cultural establishment at the time. Now let's watch this. A whimsical sociologist rather than a penetrating philosopher or a deep thinking psychologist. I do believe he is a popularizer. I do believe in five years we will look back at this book and perhaps shrug our shoulders. I don't think it's um, of long or lasting influence. Now, very importantly, he was also a media icon, a darling of the media at the day. He gave a lot of TV interviews, interviews for magazines like Playboy, and he had even this kind of very Zizesque appearance in Woody Allen's famous movie, Annie Hall. Let's take a look. Marshall McLuhan. You don't know anything about Marshall McLuhan's oh, really? work. Really? Really? I happen to teach a class at Columbia called TV, Media, and Culture. So I think that my insights into Mr. McLuhan, well, have a great deal of validity. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny because I happen to have Mr. McLuhan right here. So, so, yeah, just let me, let me, let me, let me come over here a second. Oh, tell I heard, him. I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. You mean my whole fallacy is wrong. How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. Boy, if life were only like this. There's one big difference, though. McLuhan was not really political. The book that made McLuhan famous in the early 1960s, Understanding Media, basically refers not simply to media, but to technology. It, famously, the book starts uh, talking about electric light, which McLuhan regards as a medium. Uh, and then he also talks sometimes about simple tools, artifacts, wheels, which he regards as extensions of the human body or other human functions. Much later, he reformulated this notion of extension in a more detailed way and spoke about four functions of media. They enhance, they obsolesce, they retrieve, and they reverse. But we will not focus on these laws of media of the later McLuhan. Despite this very wide notion of media in the general sense of technology, there is a very strong focus in McLuhan's work on actually the new media of the 20th century, that is, electronic communication media, specifically television and film. Now, very importantly, he treats media differently from the theorists that we talked about earlier in this series. Both Benjamin and Adorno are influenced by Marxism and have, so to speak, a materialist perspective on media. They look at media in terms of, let's say, a certain mode of production. They look at media in socio-political contexts. And in this way, for instance, Adorno coins the notion of a cultural industry. That is a kind of materialist approach to media by conceiving of them as an industry. That's different from other thinkers like Zizek or, for instance, Chomsky, who we'll talk later about in this series, who, in a wider sense, have an idealist approach to media. Not that they are idealist in the common use of the word, but that they see media 
as propagating some ideas or a certain ideology. Now, McLuhan does neither of the two. He looks, as we said, at media first and foremost as technology. So if you will, that's a technologist approach to media. And I think we could call it even a sort of pre-post-humanist approach to media. He looks how technology shapes humans in a new way. This outlook is very common today. That's a core question we ask about the internet or AI. How does this technology reshape human life? And that's a McLuhan-like question. Now, I want to treat McLuhan in five memes, or to use his language, in five mosaic pieces. Very famous expressions he coined. The first one is, the medium is the message. The second one is, we shape our tools, and thereafter they shape us. The third one is the notion of the rearview mirror. Number four, the global village. And then, finally, number five, the vortex of energy. First, the medium is the message. The medium is the message is actually the title of the first chapter of the book Understanding Media. And here he writes, many people would be disposed to say that it was not the machine, but what one did with the machine. That was its meaning or message. In terms of the ways in which the machine altered our relations to one another and to ourselves. It mattered not in the least whether it turned out cornflakes or Cadillacs. So McLuhan's view here represents a certain switch from what I'd like to call modernist agency to postmodernist contingency. A typical modernist discourse would be asking the question, what do we do with it? Which meanings or messages do we create? And this was also how McLuhan was a professor for English literature. Literature was interpreted as somehow an expression of human ideas, and thereby as an expression of human subjectivity and human productivity. There was a strong emphasis on content, on intentionality, the ideas we express in novels or poems, an emphasis on spiritual or intellectual agency. A focus on the message. Now McLuhan switches this around. He switches the focus to the medium. Now he's interested in the technology, not the mode of production, and in how content is created with and through technology. For him, ideas are now just cornflakes or Cadillacs, high and low, advertising or Shakespeare. They are contingent and secondary. What is primary is not what we do with the media, but what do the media to us? Or what does the medium or what does the technology to us? The medium is now the agent and humans are subjected to it. It conditions humans. This goes against the modernist narrative of the sovereign individual. Media are no longer primarily means of human creativity and agency, but they condition humans. This brings us to the proclamation, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. This is actually a fake McLuhan quote. The quote is from a text written by one of McLuhan's acquaintances, Father John Culkin, in a text titled, A Schoolman's Guide to McLuhan. This pronouncement expresses an emphasis shift from agency to a sort of human existential transformation. McLuhan says, the machine altered our relations to one another and to ourselves. Now the pronouncement, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us, not only addresses this shift away from agency, but also if you look more closely at it, it also points out that machines or media become tools for self-shaping. We shape them so that they can shape us. 
we shape them in order to use them to reshape ourselves. So, in my language, what this sentence expresses is that technological change brings about a change in identity technology, a change in the mode by which we produce ourselves. So, the pronouncement is post-humanist, not in the sense that we become something other than human or superhuman, but in the sense that the use of technology reveals somehow the contingency of human identity. Identity is not essential, but varies with the technologies used for shaping it. In this sense, technologies, and very importantly, media technologies, are always already also identity technologies. The tools we shape are used for our self-shaping. Now, the third meme I want to look at is the metaphor of the rear-view mirror. Famously, McLuhan wrote, we look at the present through a rear-view mirror. We march backwards into the future. This is actually written in the book, The Medium is the Massage. In a film with the same title, McLuhan says the following. Or rather, what people see in the new is always the old thing, the rear view mirror. And what people see at any time, what their attention is focused upon, is always the rear view mirror, never the present image or the present fact. The future of the future is the present. And this is something that people are terrified of. The pronouncement about the rearview mirror is followed up with the following sentence. Suburbia lives imaginatively in bonanza land. Suburbia lives imaginatively in bonanza land. And he explains this in the following way. Yeah, they live in bonanza land. One stage back, the Cartwright territory is a much more comfortable mm. territory to live in than modern suburbia. Uh, Im that is, emotionally, it is much more gratifying and secure to live in Bonanza land, and uh, it is the old environment. Every time a new environment forms with a new medium, people go back and live in the old one. When, uh, when Car the Cartwrights were actually running uh, uh, USA, uh, say back in 1850, 1870... Here, too, McLuhan is Zizek-esque. He refers to the popular TV series Bonanza of the 1960s, which portrayed the Wild West. McLuhan refers to the TV series Bonanza, which was very popular in the 1960s, and presented the Wild West, at a time the 1960s, when new technologies, television and so forth, were developing rapidly, and along with this also new identity technologies. McLuhan's point is that at this time people found comfort in the old technologies, on the one hand, the technologies of the Wild West before, for instance, cars, and also the old identity technologies that constructed the old heroes of the rural West rather than the new suburban man in front of the television set. For McLuhan, Bonanza Land, on the one hand, represents the old technologies that predated electronic technologies, but on the other hand, it also represents the old identity technologies. And he calls these identity cards that no longer work. Let's listen to him. In the new electric world, where everybody is involved in everybody, where everybody is involved in complex processes that are going on in the total environment, the old identity cards that used to constitute private identity, the old means of finding out who am I, uh, will not work. And then he goes on like this. 
to further explain those old identity cards. The old methods of merely external uh, identity by uh, marks of uh, occupation, national origin, age grouping and so on, these will not serve any longer as means of distinguishing private identity. Clearly, these identity cards are the cards of sincerity, the formation of identity in orientation to traditional social roles. However, in this very clip, McLuhan also contradicts himself. Contrary to what he says otherwise, and again this confirms that he was not really the most consistent or coherent theorist, McLuhan identifies here the new identity of the electronic age in terms of authenticity. Let's listen to it. People uh, now have to encounter themselves in the inner world, uh, Kierkegaard or existential style, in order to know who they are. What McLuhan says here is that the Bonanza land, created in the media of the 1960s, is a land of sincerity as seen in the rearview mirror. And it is seen while it's making way for the new electronic world, which is depicted here in terms of authenticity as the inner world Kierkegaard style. So he basically claims here that authenticity is replacing the Bonanza land. But again, this is not his usual claim. We will now see that he does not describe commonly the electric world in terms of authenticity, but rather in terms of prophylicity. Of course, he doesn't use the notion of prophylicity, but his very central concept of the global village is an early predecessor of the notion of prophylicity. McLuhan's global village, contrary to that short clip about Kierkegaard and the inner self, it was for McLuhan normally precisely not a place of authenticity. And this is outlined in great detail in his book, The Gutenberg Galaxy. Here, he introduces the global village in the context of the transition from what he calls the Gutenberg galaxy represented by Gutenberg man to the global village. The Gutenberg man stands for traditional print technology, books. These promote individualism connected, for instance, with authenticity and with personal fragmentation and with an emphasis on privacy. Crucially, the new electronic media that constitute the global village destroy privacy. They bring back what McLuhan calls the tribal world. Now, rather than separate individuals, we all live in a village together knowing what everyone else does basically all the time. Instead of an inner world, we now inhabit a shared common world of simultaneity and great constant mutual involvement. That is the global village. The electronic world of the global village is not an inner world of individual selves, but precisely its opposite, a social world of total mutual involvement. McLuhan says as much here. Well, I think you'll find everything we observed tonight about the media uh, points in the direction of tribal man and away from individual man. Now, by individual man, I assume that you're referring to John's literary man. Yes, uh, and, and tribal man is the man created by the new electronic media. So that this would be the basic change we spoke of at the beginning. Yes, we're retribalizing. Involuntarily, we're getting rid of individualism. We're in a process of making a tribe. For just as books and their private point of view are being replaced by the new media, so the concepts which underlie our actions, our social life, are changing. We are no longer so concerned with self-definition, with finding our own individual way. Uh, what the group, we, we're more concerned with what the group knows, of feeling as it does, of acting with it, not apart from it. And here we have this wonderful short clip describing tribal man, the inhabitant of the new global village. Tribal men and women are humans 
shaping their identities in loops, in communication feedback loops. Like in a traditional village, where also everyone was constantly getting feedback from everyone else and was observing how everyone else observed them. McLuhan says, The idea of feedback, of being involved in one's, uh, participating in one's own audience participation is a natural product of this circuitry. Yeah. Everything, everything under electric conditions is looped. You become folded over into yourself, into your, your image of yourself changes completely. This is an early description of prophylicity. To highlight two important aspects of the global village are first, there is no privacy. As in pre-individualist society, in pre-modern society, in the actual old tribal society, there is a return to tribal communality. McLuhan says, Privacy was almost unknown, uh, even in Shakespeare's day. It came in after that period, in the 17th, 18th centuries, and it was dependent upon uh, an architecture that uh, sealed off spaces. Uh, people didn't live in private spaces in uh, uh, earlier periods, and uh, it was with the coming of the book and uh, the need for uh, areas in, uh, private areas in which to read and study and so on that privacy gradually caught on as a value. I don't think privacy has quite the same meaning in our time that it used to have. I know, uh, for example, a big business in Toronto where all the private offices have been uh, dissolved, all the walls have been pulled out so that the um, participants in this business can sit together around tables in the middle of the big office space so that they can watch each other's responses to stocks and uh, world events and so on. They want a, a perpetual dialogue going on among themselves as a response to world events. In such a world, where we need constant feedback loops, privacy and individuality and authenticity as it is associated with, for instance, private silent reading or unshared personal ideas makes no sense. Like on YouTube, in the global village, we want constant reaction by our peers. The value of privacy that is still so often heard of and mentioned in the global village is in fact a rear view mirror value left over from the age of authenticity. Secondly, although the global village is a communal place, it's not a place of perfect harmony at all. McLuhan says, the global village is at once plan as wide as the planet and as small as a little town where everybody is maliciously engaged and poking his nose at everybody else's business. The uh, global village is a world in which uh, you don't necessarily have harmony. You have extreme concern with everybody else's business and much involvement in everybody else's life. The global village does not represent some form of idyllic return back to nature. It is a place of mutual surveillance by technological means and of constant feedback interference. Now finally, to the vortex of energy. In you and your profile, we start with an epigraph from McLuhan, which is taken from a 1975 lecture on man and media. Here it is. The huge vortices of energy created by our media present us with similar possibilities of evasion, of consequences, of destruction. By studying the pattern of the effects of this huge vortex of energy that, in which we're involved, it may be possible to program a strategy of evasion and survival. McLuhan here refers to a story by Edgar Allan Poe, titled The Descend into the Maelstrom which is about a sailor who is about to drown in a vortex. And in order to survive, he observes the objects that reappear in the maelstrom, in the vortex. And then eventually he clings on to them. So he studies the pattern of the vortex in order to finally be able to survive in its midst. I think this is a powerful allegory that basically shows that the media, like this vortex of energy, 
are shaping us, shaping our movements. They are the environment that condition us. And they are neither right nor wrong. We live inevitably in and with them. And in order to survive, to do well in them, to achieve well-being, we should not try and go against them. This is a kind of Taoist survival strategy. And it's also a Stoic survival strategy because we survive by reflective understanding and adaptation. So I guess the point of the metaphor is that we need to study the technologies that condition us and that condition our self-making in order not to drown in these technologies mindlessly. This also means we need to become aware of our identity technologies, which function in mutual feedback loops with electronic technologies. So here's a conclusion. Three main takeaways. First, instead of advocating a rear-view mirror return to an idealized past, make sure to survive in the new electronic environment and in the new media by describing these patterns dispassionately and by understanding them. Unlike so many others today, don't just look into the rear view mirror of authenticity. Don't develop a nostalgia for authenticity in the Netflix land that nowadays simulates authenticity, just as in the 1960s, the Bonanza land simulated sincerity. But also, unlike the technology apologists, don't succumb to profilicity enthusiasm. Be aware of the dangers of this vortex of energy, where we can easily drown in endless social validation feedback loops of profile curation, moving back and forth between self-display and peer surveillance. Now, speaking of profilicity, in response to our last video on Adorna and Horkheimer, Simon Lattendress wrote, Thanks, but how is your theory on profilicity anything different from de Boer's theory of the spectacle? Good question, Simon. That's what we're going to do next time, answering this question. By the way, I promised earlier that I'm going to do Chomsky, and I'll do that at a later stage. We're moving forward chronologically.